Hello, everyone. I um, give you a second to get ready for us to start tonight. My name is Chris Marchetti. I'm the principal at Central Elementary School, and I'd like to um, welcome everybody from the Nesbitt and Central communities. Welcome back to people who have been here before and um, say hello and welcome to the, all the new families that we have tonight. So um, tonight is a little unusual meeting like this and at this time of the year, but this is probably going to be an unusual year. We, um, we are going to, uh, tonight's town hall is set up, give you an opportunity to see what plans we've put in place and what things we're talking about and thinking about for the future. Um, we, um, we're looking forward to this year, even though it's going to be a little crazy. Um, so let me uh, also, and start by introducing the new principal at Nesbitt, um, Ryan Hansen Vera. So, for, hi, Ryan. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan Hansen Vera. I am the new proud principal of Nesbitt, and I am really excited to be joining BRSSD, um, even under these very uh, unusual circumstances. Um, again, the purpose tonight is to just share with you and build that transparency, and I'm really um, happy to be coupled with Chris and working with the staff and parents at Central as well. So thank you. Um, we are pivoting and moving right through to distance learning, um, but, we, but Chris and I also want you to know that we are not um, abandoning our plans for that hybrid model and we're keeping everything in our sight and mind and we're looking forward to answering your questions this evening. Um, so I would like to roll it over to the panel and introduce our superintendent, Dan, um, Rui, and Ching Pei. Awesome, thank you, Ryan, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'd like to extend a, a good evening and welcome to the Nesbitt and Central families. I'm really glad that you're able to join us tonight. Thank you so much. Um, as Ryan shared, my name is Dan DeGuara and I'm honored to be serving as the new superintendent. Um, in the perfect world, um, I wouldn't be meeting you this way, I'd be meeting you in person. Uh, however, these are some extraordinary times. Um, as we begin tonight, I wanna share uh, that we will be recording this town hall and we'll post it on our website. So for those who aren't able to join us, they'll be able to access the information in the future. Uh, tonight we will begin um, but first, uh, we'll beginning our, be beginning our school year in a 100% full distance learning model with the goal of transitioning to a hybrid model following all established guidelines and protocols once it's safe to do so. So the hybrid is really our goal, uh, short term, hopefully it's just short term, is 100% full distance learning. Uh, we remain committed to a successful 2020-21 uh, school year. And tonight I'd like to recognize trustees that are in our audience today. Uh, trustees Howard, Trustee Leinbach, and Trustee Koo. Uh, we appreciate you joining us uh, tonight. Um, so tonight uh, we'll split our time roughly in half. Um, we'll spend the first half hour or so uh, with a presentation talking about safety, talking about models of implementation, and how we're gonna move forward successfully into the 2021 school year. Uh, following the, the presentation, we'll take questions uh, via the chat. You can enter your questions as you're going in the chat feature below. The questions are gonna go directly to Pam, um, who's gonna moderate for us. And just so you know, all of the panelists also see your questions, so we'll, we'll do our best uh, to shift on the fly and answer those as they come in. We'll do our absolute best to get through all the questions, as many as we can, uh, but your questions also help us know what trends are out there and what people are thinking. So uh, please feel free to answer those questions. If they don't get answered tonight, uh, we'll definitely work on covering that. Uh, tonight is just the start of uh, many communications. Um, our principals are uh, back in the swing of things, and I want to encourage you uh, to reach out to them with questions as well, and, and they'll be working with you um, over the next couple weeks until we launch into the new school year. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like uh, to introduce again uh, Rui Bao. Uh, she's going to go ahead and get us started tonight. All right. Thanks, Dan. 
Good evening. Um, so this presentation is going to look similar uh, and very familiar to those who are at the board meeting on July 23rd. Uh, we wanted to make the information that we shared that night more widely accessible and in addition add some more school specific components and most importantly time for some Q&A. So to begin, uh, I wanted to introduce the guiding principles developed by our Board of Trustees for school reopening. These principles guide us in our development of all our school reopening models, whether that is hybrid or distance. And specifically, these guiding principles are to prioritize safety, ensure instructional quality, facilitate effective and open communication, promote consistency, and foster reciprocal accountability. And you'll see how each of these principles play out um, as we talk through our various models. Um, I won't linger too much on the specifics here other than to note that new guidance is constantly being updated by the CDC, the California Department of Public Health, the California Department of Education, and San Mateo County. And just know that we are consistently monitoring these updates to make sure that our protocols are following their guidelines. Uh, and with that, um, as you know, on July 23rd, our Board of Trustees met and voted to adopt a dual model that included both an in-person instructional model with AV as well as an option for families to attend remotely, um, also on the AV, because uh, should uh, county and state guidelines allow, because San Mateo County is now on the watch list, we are opening in full distance. Um, which will not be a B, it's just full daily distance, and Pei will go into the details of um, that a little bit later on. And so with that, um, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of our health and safety section because most of the things here pertains to our hybrid model. Uh, and since we're opening in full distance, I'm sure that most folks are, are more curious about uh, the instructional details. Um, but I wanted to, to open with this just to, so everyone knows that we are still actively planning for the hybrid model as we anticipate that at some point uh, between full distance and Fingers crossed normalcy whenever that comes, uh, we will be in the hybrid model. So it's important that we're continuing these plannings. Uh, so the governor has released a criteria around when schools can open and when uh, schools are open, how to close. Um, and these, this, these are guidelines that uh, we are committed to following. Um, we're also daily monitoring San Mateo County data. Um, our hybrid model is uh, based in the San Mateo pandemic recovery framework, uh, which has four pillars uh, for return to school safety. And that's health and hygiene, face coverings, physical distancing, and limited gatherings. And what that tactically means for us at schools. Um, first of all, it's really rethinking and redesigning our classrooms um, to allow for stable cohorts of 12 to 15 students um, and laying out the classroom in a way to make sure that uh, social distancing will be feasible um, and encouraged. Um, in addition, we will be cleaning classrooms before, between cohorts uh, using an EPA approved substance. So EPA has released a list of substances recommended for treating COVID-19 on surfaces um, and we'll be using that. Face covering. So uh, we are expecting our adults and students to follow public health guidance on this and wear masks at all times, um, with some exceptions for students in younger grades. Students who refuse to wear masks can be referred to distance learning to ensure the safety of folks on campus. Um, we're working with our healthcare partners, uh, as well as San Mateo County around testing. Um, and then for staff, and this is actually true whether it's hybrid or distance learning, uh, but when staff come to campus, we do want them to undergo a daily temperature check as well as a self-certification form. Um, again, this is just to ensure when students come back, there will be uh, uh, temperature screening as well. This is, again, just to ensure the safety of our campuses um, and the consideration of others on campus. Um, when it comes to thinking about re-entry protocols, so as we shift from uh, distance to hybrid, we know that there's a lot of questions around designated entry and exit locations, um, the logistics of the symptoms checks, um, making sure that we assign desks, backpack hooks, classroom cubbies, et cetera, bathrooms, um, and staggering schedules um, to really minimize exposure and maximize social distancing. Um, these are protocols that our site leaders have been thinking about deeply um, and will continue to develop and communicate. 
a question that I get a lot is around PPE and the provisions there. Um, so I wanted to give a quick overview. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, students and staff will be expected to wear masks and provide their own masks as that is, as that is now public health guidelines. However, uh, things do happen. And so we do have backup masks, uh, both adult and child sized. Um, we are providing N95s and gloves for our nurses. Um, for our special education staff, movable plexiglass barriers for assessments, as well as face shields with cloth drapes. Um, and then finally, all of our front offices um, have plexiglass barriers installed and we'll have standing hand sanitizer stands um, outdoors. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan for a, a school specific example of what this looks like. Sure, thank you. So um, it's important to know that at both Central and Nesbitt, um, principals went ahead and inventoried every classroom. And what you'll see here is an example of an elementary classroom that is in first grade, an elementary fifth grade classroom, and then a middle school classroom. And we went ahead and inventoried all the furniture to make sure that we can accommodate cohorts of 12 to 15 students safely with proper spacing and then proper space. Um, we want the classrooms to still feel welcoming and inviting. Um, and um, that teachers are still able to build strong school culture as we welcome kiddos back into class, the classroom safely. Um, so what you'll see here is examples of that. And, and really at, at Nesbitt, um, our initial plans have been evaluating our campus's space and uh, taking tours of the campus and really thinking about when we move to hybrid as well, all of the entry and exit locations uh, how to safely accommodate and plan for material drop-off and pickup, uh, technology distribution, and all of those things. But this is our first um, efforts at setting up some model classrooms for our teachers, as well as giving them a list of guidelines so that they can help in the preparation of what their classroom space will look like when we go hybrid. Thanks, Ryan. And with that, I will turn it over to Ching Pei for our instructional design. Okay, so I'm going to go through quickly because I know people really want to hear about getting to distance. Um, we just want to make sure you know that these plans are continuing to happen. We don't know when the situation is going to shift. Um, so even though we are fully dialed up right now in distance learning for 100% of our students, meaning that everybody will have five days a week of daily instruction, live instruction with their classroom teacher, we could shift at some point. There have been some questions about the waiver. The waiver process is still being clarified. Um, it was released Monday night at 7.30 and we're trying to understand all the requirements. One component that we don't have much control over at this point is the availability of testing for our staff. And so we will continue to monitor this and work for um, whatever makes sense. If we are able to apply for a waiver at some point, we will start with our most vulnerable learners um, and, and work our way through to those who really can't tolerate distance learning to try and bring kids back. But again, there are several stipulations and we need to make sure that it is safe to do so um, and that it makes sense for our staff and our students. So right now we are on the watch list. We are in full distance learning. There is guidance from the state um, for all districts. I think we all experience spring and, and, and the myriad um, methodologies applied and you know the experiences ran, ran the gamut. So we wanna make sure you understand that there is legal guidance from our State Department of Education and, this, and the state legislature so that we can create consistency for students, not just within BRSSD, but across the state of California, so that we don't add to the achievement gap. Um, you don't need me to read these, these bullet points to you. Um, I do wanna talk to you through uh, some requirements that we are following that we wanna make sure that everyone in our community is aware of. Live daily instruction for your students means two-way instruction. It does not mean that a teacher will record the lesson and post it and that's considered live. There will be times when your teacher posts a recording um, as part of asynchronous learning, or potentially your teacher is sick and they still want the learning to continue, so they will record a lesson for the day and have your students work through. But live daily instruction means that your child will have interaction with his or her teacher on a regular basis, on a predictable scheduled basis. Um, 
we are monitoring student attendance in the spring. It didn't matter. We know it was stressful and everyone's family situations were different and we were making, you know, we, we all needed to make adjustments, but I, we need the community to know that attendance is mandatory. We have to mark attendance. We will follow up with students who are not participating just like we normally do with truancy and chronic absenteeism um, in pre-COVID days. School is important for everyone. So know that we will be monitoring that. There will be required minutes of instruction for each grade level span. Kindergarten and TK are, TK is considered year one of a two-year kindergarten program. So TK and K have 180 minutes of daily instruction required by the state. Grades one through three are required to provide 230 minutes and grades four plus are required to have 240 minutes. So functionally speaking, your students will get between three and four hours of instruction on a daily basis. We will absolutely continue to meet the needs of our students with special education needs, just through a remote setting and not in person. Um, one of the, the, the bottom line really is the, the piece that's, that's new, that's different from in-person on-campus learning. One of the kind of requirements is that we as a district pay attention to students who are engaged and disengaged. So we have to keep engagement records. We have to pay attention to who's online and who's turning in work. So it will not be sufficient that you do all of your work offline and just turn it in because we need to make sure we're still monitoring and having interactions with your students. We are also going to make sure that we work with families to ensure that there's connectivity and Wi-Fi access and not just the hardware. We certainly have hardware. We have Chromebooks to lend out to anybody who needs um, one to make sure that every child in their family has a device. We understand lots of people like to buy their own and that's perfectly fine too, but we will have materials ready for students who need it. I want to lay out here so that we all have a common understanding of what synchronous learning looks like versus asynchronous learning. As you would imagine, synchronous would mean that we're doing the same thing at the same time, and we may not be in the same physical locale, but we're going to be in the same remote virtual room together, and the teacher will be giving live feedback and having interaction with their peers. Um, and asynchronous activities happen throughout the day during the regular school day. Typically a teacher will give a lesson and then release students to do some independent practice while the teacher works with individual students or assesses students or works with small groups of students. Um, and students spend a large chunk of their day at school working asynchronously and independently because the person who does the most talking and the person who does the most writing is the person who learns the most. So we try to make sure our students have that opportunity. Um, in asynchronous learning, this is where the activities are not happening at the same time. You will have a balance of synchronous and asynchronous. I don't want people walking away thinking their students are going to be monitored and online and live in front of the screen the entire instructional day. There will be some times when your student will be working independently on something that the teacher is asking them to turn in, in in either 20 minutes, an hour, the next day, whatever it be. Um, we talked a little bit about how distance learning was pretty varied in the spring. We understand, we've heard the feedback both from the staff and the parents. Um, with the SB 98 requirements, please note we are going to be progress monitoring. That means giving assessments, monitoring student progress, and differentiating instruction as need meet, which is why it's so important that we have the ability to provide asynchronous learning opportunities while the teacher works with small groups of instruction to either provide challenge activities or uh, enrichment activities or um, additional support as necessary. There will be a report card, just like normal, with standard scores and reports and grades. Um, you'll have between three and four hours of instruction. There's going to be a predictable schedule for synchronous learning. There will be consistent communication to the families. Um, that's also one of the requirements of SB 98, that teachers keep families abreast of how the students are progressing, what's going well, what's not going well. Um, and because we are streamlining the various platforms teachers are going to be using through through a wide array of purchases thanks to the support from School Force, we will be able to plan professional development in a much more consistent manner. During the summer, our teachers have already availed themselves of um, training that the district has provided. We haven't led the training, but we've paid for training for teachers to attend the San Mateo County Office of Ed led um, distance learning cohort in partnership with the San Mateo, um, with the City College. We've had teachers taking Google level one, level two certification courses. We've had teachers involved with ISTE, which is the International Society of Teachers, teachers for 
technology educators. Um, so we've had several different training opportunities for teachers this summer, specifically focused on use of tech tools and preparing for distance learning. We also have several planned between now and the start of the school year, and then we will be able to continue with ongoing professional development. What we what we uh, don't want is a sit and get one and done. We want to make sure we give folks the tools they need and then give continuing support as we learn to use them better and as we see what the actual difficulties are and, and, and try and really make sure we are working smarter and not working harder. I, you know, this is, this is unprecedented times for sure. Um, just so you as a fam as families understand what the what the platforms will look like. We are creating some consistency. So for families with students in TK through three, you can expect to receive your communication via Seesaw. For uh, families in grades four or five and at Nesbitt in six to eight, you can expect to receive your communication via uh, classroom and school loop. Um, the six their eighth grade teachers rely on school loop to send daily messages on who's turned in what and who's still missing assignments. Um, that's the student and family facing portals. And then for the teacher end, they are going to be collecting schoolwork and creating student portfolios and managing work in a little bit different manner than if they were live and in person, but they're still going to collect student work, house it, score it, give it back, get the back. Not everything that just gets turned in is going to get marked up. That's just kind of like reality, but teachers will be looking at their work and providing feedback. So they'll use Seesaw in the primary grades and then classroom with an Illuminate integration um, in the grades three through eight. What's gonna be really nice is those who opt into the grade book will be able to um, share with families how students are doing in each individual content area and each individual grade book and parents can independently look on the portal several teachers at uh, nesbitt already use the grade book so that shouldn't be news um it shouldn't be a new learning for most and then we have a lot of curricular support both for the students to access supplemental materials but also so the teachers can do some creation ultimately we are using our adopted curriculum. SB 98 asks that we as teachers provide grade level, grade level standards-based rigorous instruction that is in kind to what they would receive if students were in person. So the thing that makes the most sense is to use our adopted curriculum. We have great curriculum that is diverse, that um, is multicultural, that hits the standards, that our teachers know how to use. And so what we're going to be focusing on is allowing the teachers to focus on the teaching part and we'll be focusing on supporting them with the technical aspect of how do I do this in a remote setting. Um, so there's a, a number of tools to support, but ultimately your base curriculum is going to be our adopted textbooks, the same materials that we've been using that you're familiar with, that our students and teachers are familiar with. We will need to work out at a site level the individual logistics of who needs a Chromebook to borrow, who's going to, when are we coming to get it? Because we also have science textbooks, social studies textbooks, and workbooks, math textbooks, and workbooks. Everything that we've ordered for your students has shipped and arrived at the school. Um, and we want to make sure you have access to the hardbound copies. Because while everything is available on Clever and you could do everything digitally, Sometimes paper and pencil is nice because it's a break from the screen, but it also is important because we still want our kids to develop their fine motor skills and learn how to write their letters um, and just take a break from the screen. <laughs> So again, another text heavy uh, slide. I don't wanna read everything to you about the characteristics of live distance learning, but I want you to know that when we say live instruction, we mean that there is two way interaction. This would not, this would not suffice because right now, while you are able to chat questions to us, we're not having interaction. Um, when we have smaller meetings and where we can do it, when we can do it and have conversation back and forth, that's a live interaction and it's, certainly better than this. Uh, we want you to know too that even though we have sample schedules and I'm going to show you in a minute, they are samples. We are still working out the logistics and the final details with our teachers union and we will share as soon as we have anything finalized. But regardless, your students will not be staring at a screen the entire day. There will be a balance of synchronous instruction led and directed by the teacher and asynchronous learning where the teacher will say to your students, you have so much time to accomplish so many tasks and I'm gonna check back in with you at 11.45. So 
as you can imagine, there's going to be some teaching to the students of how do I know when to log back in? How do I, how can I utilize my technology to set a timer? Um, I know my little eight-year-old is very proficient at shouting at Alexa. So there are going to be teaching points that maybe feel like tech heavy, but really are about supporting the instruction in the classroom. So just be prepared that even though your teacher is leading instruction, there will be time when your child is expected to work independently. We don't expect families to be the teachers. We do expect our teachers to take the driver's role on this and give guidance, but this is going to be a partnership. Some of our kids are very independent and won't need our help, and some of them are going to need us to get them into the swing of things and teach them the routine at home and reinforce the routine as they get used to learning from home, because it is going to be far more rigorous for many than it was in the spring. So here's a sample elementary schedule. Um, we don't know the specifics. We, I mean, we're, we're, we're still working the details out, but what we're proposing is splitting the day into instructional blocks so that families know when to expect live instruction and when to expect some asynchronous practice. Ultimately, we expect the teachers to log in at every instructional block and, and do their, their kind of normal cadence of, here's a whole group lesson. Now, everybody go work, but I need Ryan, Rui, and Chris to stay online because I'm going to work in a small group with you. Okay, good job. I'm going to release you now, and I'm going to check in with some other students. So whether that's scheduled or everybody stays online, but some people just close their camera, um, those are going to be a little bit individualized based off of both the grade level of the student and the teacher comfort with the technology. But we are trying to mimic the day for you so you have a predictable schedule as parents to know when kids are going to be online, when kids are receiving instruction, when kids have breaks, such as, uh, you know, bio break time as well as lunch break time. And then we will be ending the school day typically a little bit earlier because we need to build in additional collaboration and preparation time for the teachers. This is a different way of teaching. We want to make sure we don't cut instruction short, but we also need to make sure we have enough time for our teachers to utilize their time and provide really great instruction in the three to four hours uh, that they are online with you. Um, students will be receiving their weekly PE lesson. Thank you, School Force, for supporting our Low Garza contract. Um, it used to be paid for out of a different grant, but School Force has come to our rescue. Um, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade will receive their music instruction from our credentialed teachers. And then fourth and fifth graders will still receive their science instruction for them from the science specialists. So as families are trying to figure out what happens to curriculum. I want you to know that we have a scope and sequence and we've made adjustments because certain things can't be taught virtually. However, all of your skills and standards for the grade level will be addressed and your child will be ready to matriculate to the next grade level. Um, and we will make adjustments throughout the year and continue to monitor progress. We will continue to assess students and update our instructional plans so that we can keep kids moving forward. Um, one thing that's not noted on this slide is that all students, regardless of what grade level you are at, will have access to a counselor. For our kids in TK5, we will have 17 hours a week of support for every individual school site from one life counselors. And then for our students at Nesbitt in grades six, seven, and eight, there is a half-time school counselor who is split between Nesbitt and Sandpiper. And as a half-time employee, the sixth through eighth graders are getting about 17 hours of time from the employee as well. So it's commensurate across the board. This will be for tier one universal social emotional learning support, but also tier two and individualized and small group counseling to support the kids. We know that kids are coming back in a very strange circumstance. We want to support them, not just in their academics, but in their whole child. So what I have up on the screen right now is a sample middle school schedule um, to give you a sense of how we would split the day so that it's predictable. Um, the periods are slightly longer than the regular in-person day, um, but ultimately your child will see all seven teachers, just not all seven in one day. Because as you can imagine, Zoom fatigue with seven classes every single day is uh, enough to <laughs> beat down the most motivated students. So we want to make sure we break it up, but also allow for more and inst more longer instructional blocks so that we can be more effective in our time together. 
you're probably wondering, well, the teachers are occupied with the students. What's happening to all the other people that our school district pays for that are hired to support our students? So this is what this slide is about. We have several staff members who play varying roles. So whether your child sees a reading specialist, whether they go to Mrs. McMaster or um, Mrs. Wilkinson, they will still get to see the specialist just via remote. Um, whether they have SLP services or OT services, those will continue as well. We will work with individual families to update 504 plans and IEPs to ensure all services are met. It may look different, the, the minutes might be different, the skills might be different simply because of the need. Um, so we'll adjust those with you in partnership. Our music teachers and science teachers are still teaching the students following a regular schedule. Our library and media clerks are very interested, uh, are going to be continuing their schedule. I know both at Central and Nesbitt in the spring, our media clerks really made an effort to create activities for students. Um, you'll notice some of the specialists will be with your students independently and some will be with teacher participation. And this is this is based off of whether they're a certificated staff member or a classified staff member. So when we're regularly at school in person, our teachers support the library media clerks and don't leave them alone because they're classified staff. They don't have supervisory responsibilities. So the same thing's gonna happen here um, in remote. And then you'll notice, say PE, for example, the PE teachers will take the students without their classroom teacher present. And that's because they will have their um, sub-credentials just like they do when they interact live and in person. Um, a lot of people are wondering, what can you do as parents at home to support? This is a partnership. I think we'd be naive to think that our, while our teachers are gonna take the driver's seat, they're not gonna be able to do it by themselves. Um, it's a whole different world out there um, with technology as, the, as, as a barrier. So I think a couple of things are really important as a parent. Um, designate a learning spot for your child. It doesn't have to be a beautiful desk in their own bedroom but it should be a consistent spot where they can learn without distraction, where they can focus, whether you use head, uh, headphones or headset or something with a microphone so that maybe your multiple siblings can be in the same room at the same time without having to hear um, each other's teacher. I think that's important. Continue to check in with your kids. Make sure they know that you're engaged in, in their learning, that, that you care about what's happening, that it matters to you that they continue to stay focused in school. Follow a routine. I can't tell you enough. I mean, my family used to give me the hardest time because I had such a strict routine for my, my son when he was a baby. But let me tell you, to this day, he's an amazing sleeper and it makes such a difference. Whereas my daughter, I kind of lost my mind because she was the second and I was principal. And <laughs> the routine matters. It really helps. Um, think time. Our kids really need time to process what's going on. So if you're feeling like, they're not going as quickly as they used to. Just remember that this is a traumatic learning experience. It is different. We are going to teach them and we're going to give them SEL skills and we're going to teach them resiliency and we're going to have a lot of activities that are not academic focused in order to support our kids. But it's okay if you feel like they're taking longer to process things. Um, do make sure that as a family you get out and exercise. I am the laziest person on the face of this planet. I hate exercise, but I have to say doing my Zoom workouts with my, with my trainers over the past six months has been a lifesaver. And if I didn't have that, I think I might not be quite as mentally sane as I am today. Um, do make sure too that if you're not feeling like you uh, are comfortable in having a social bubble and you're not seeing people outside of your immediate family, that's your comfort level. That's 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 where you're at. Do make sure though there are still social interactions for your kids. Take advantage of the technology that we have these days to set up virtual play dates, FaceTime, Zoom, Google. Um, I think it's really important to remember that our kids are social beings and a large part of their development is interacting with other kids that are their age and having time where they can be goofy and silly with peers without their parents' eyes and ears on them all the time. They need a break from us as much as we need a break from them. So let's utilize technology and or if, if you're at the comfort level and you have a social bubble, take advantage of it. And then the final piece is we're moving online. This is new learning for everybody. We are going to need to work together to teach our kids to be good digital citizens. We will have formal lessons. We have supports for our teachers who um, 
we have we've never had them prior but we do have new curriculum available in the tools that we've purchased again thank you school force and thank you to the brssd community for making that possible but we have curriculum we're going to teach them about how you stay engaged when do you turn your camera off how do you use chat what is your digital footprint how can we make sure we're being safe and we're not being um we're, we're not putting ourselves at risk to predators. All of those lessons are going to be formal and taught as part of our daily interaction with your students. But as a partner in educating your child, we ask that you help us as well and help reinforce and, and help model with them. When you see that they're on two tabs at once, maybe remind them that you're at school right now. Your teacher can kind of tell what's going on. <laughs> um, so that's, those are some tools and tips for us. I'm going to hand it over now to Dan to talk to you a little bit about next steps. Great, thank you, Qingpei. Uh, so every time uh, we, we finish with that piece, you can really just see how passionate Qingpei is about her work. Um, that really is so, so much appreciated. So a couple of, of next steps that we typically get. If we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so how are we gonna think about transitioning in and out? So um, we initially had thought we were gonna open with a hybrid model. Uh, we moved to the watch list. So now we're opening with the distance learning model. Again, 100%, no AB days, 100% distance learning. And when we think about our transition um, back and forth, uh, we're, we're ballparking about a six week time frame uh, to be able to make the adjustments appropriately. So um, when you come off of the watch list, you need 14 consecutive days of being off the watch list before you transition or are allowed to go into the hybrid model. So we'll start planning as soon as we start coming, as soon as we come off that model. Um, but in terms of um, outreach and surveys, uh, there's a lot of pre-work that needs to be done. The feedback that we received on our last surveys um, was really about the timeliness and parents needing to understand what the conditions were gonna be like exactly at the point when we were transitioning. So much like our, you know, our transition over the summer, we do anticipate there's gonna be similar feelings. Uh, we will reach out to our community. Uh, we'll ask for preferences. Uh, for some, they're gonna be ready to come back to a hybrid model. For others, uh, they're gonna be most comfortable in a distance learning format. Uh, and we will continue to do our best to offer uh, those options for families. Um, so roughly a, a six week or so time frame for that transition. Um, and I will say it is schedule dependent a bit too. We wanna make sure that we optimize those transition times. There's holidays that creep in, there's reporting periods. We'll take all that into consideration when we move forward, but um, we will communicate clearly and concisely with our families on that. Um, we get a lot of questions about when we're being nimble and we're shifting in the mid-year uh, flexibility, um, families, want options to be able to shift on what's most comfortable, uh, but they also want consistency. So that's something that we are grappling with um, uh, uh, consistently. Um, each of our classes have class size ratios. Uh, we wanna make sure that our classes are balanced. That is a contractual obligation that we have with our teachers. Um, so we have to continue to main, maintain that, whether we're in full distance learning or we go to a hybrid model, we still have to maintain those class size ratios. We wanna make sure that um, typically that students stay with their teachers, that's always our default, but we recognize that when we're offering choice in those mid-year shifts, there is the potential that uh, students may need to change teachers, um, assuming that we're able to move to that hybrid model. Again, um, working with parents, uh, working with our staff, uh, we wanna do our best to honor everybody's preferences, uh, both our, our teachers um, and our families. Uh, that's really important to us. And ideally it's a perfect match. We, everybody who wants to teach di distance and everybody who wants to learn distance, there's a match. Um, but realistically that match probably won't be perfect, but we're gonna do the best that we can. Um, this uh, about cohort times, um, this is actually uh, probably the reverse. It's easier to come out of full distance into cohort, um, but we always have to make sure that we're, we're looking at um, how kids transition to make sure that we're keeping our cohorts balanced so that we can do contract tracing. Uh, should somebody get, get sick, um, that is an important piece. 
Um, and then uh, we, we just want to optimize those transition times, uh, as I was sharing, uh, based on the calendar um, as well. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and shift um, into some panel questions. I just want to say I know our chat has been uh, going pretty quick and we've been answering questions as we, we've been going along. I know we promised half and half, but a lot of those questions has been, have been answered on the fly. Um, we do want to make sure that we're answering as many questions as we can tonight, but we'll commit to uh, following up uh, as we move uh, through the next couple of weeks here. Um, one thing I do want to mention, um, I do want to just briefly talk uh, about partnerships. Uh, we've been working really hard with our daycare providers uh, to just talk about options that they're able to provide our families. As a parent of two elementary age boys, um, I totally understand the dynamic uh, that we're all uh, trying to adapt to and shift. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge for us all sincerely. Um, so working with our child provider, care providers the best that we're able, looking at additional space that we can provide um, and, and just working as closely as possible there. In terms of partnerships, I also do want to do a quick thank you uh, to School Force. Um, they have been incredibly instrumental over the years, uh, not just this year, but over the years in providing supports for our students. Uh, as we transition to distance learning and these hybrid models, uh, they've been incredibly resourceful with, with uh, materials and platforms and, and um, enrichment supports. Um, and we couldn't do all of this without their support um, and your support. So uh, please, please, please continue to support your uh, to support school force, uh, support your local PTAs. That's really, really important because uh, it's helping us provide an awesome education for our kiddos. Um, with that, I think uh, Ching Pei talked about the waiver um, already. A uh, waiver information just came out on Monday evening. We're processing that. Uh, we're going to look into it uh, probably to start with our most vulnerable learners, uh, our youngest kiddos, uh, those students with special needs. But um, there are still a lot of questions about the waiver. We need to make sure testing for staff is in place. A lot of logistics, um, but that's something that we are, are um, looking into. Um, with that, I'm going to actually prompt while Pam's looking through questions. I'll prompt Ching Pei with one put her on the spot. I saw a lot of TK and K uh, questions, our youngest kiddos. Um, if you can maybe address uh, that or any of the principals as you want to jump in. Yeah, we understand that learning through remote is not ideal for anybody and it's the hardest on our youngest kids because we don't want them on the screens all day long. I, I will say that our TK teachers all participated in training that I offered to them this spring with Stanford uh, Graduate School of Ed, looking at ways to engage and keep kids moving and doing manipulative work and hands-on experiences through the screen. And it's going to be a challenge and it's something we're gonna continue supporting them on in TKK. Our entire TKK team works really well together and collaboratively. Um, we've been in touch with them all summer long. They want to come back. We we want to be able to provide for your kids, and as soon as it is, is safe to do so, we will look at whether that's bringing back our kids who are the most vulnerable learners and our youngest students first and staggering that way or whatever model. We have several different ideas um, that we can't execute on any as of now, but we are thinking about your kids. I'm sorry that I don't have better, better information. We don't have a lot of specifics on what distance learning is gonna look like in terms of how many hours is the block, how many blocks are, of instruction are there going to be in a day, how much time, what percentage of the block will my teacher be online? Because we are still working through the details with our teacher's union. We know what state law is requiring of us. We know that our teachers need some support and prep time. We're willing to give them prep time and support and professional development. Um, but we're working out the logistics so that we can provide the students with the best instructional opportunity. Um, we really are, and I know I've said this several times, so some of you have been at multiple presentations with me. We really are tasked with making lemonade out of rotten lemons. Um, so we're doing, we, we, we have all of your questions in mind and your kids at heart. And we are trying to make the best decisions we possibly can for them. Um, while I'm here, we are talking professional development. I cannot mandate teachers attend summer training on their summer when they are not contracted to work. 
So we have offered training, we have paid for training, and we have secured new funding. So we will pay them for their time for after school training that occurs. And I can make mandatory training during their work days, which is partially why some of the trainings are happening so late. Optional trainings are wonderful. And we have a slew of teachers who have taken advantage of them, who have taken multiple trainings this summer. Um, but what we want to do is make sure we catch the teachers who are otherwise occupied during the summer. They're not paid to work. So when we come back to work, we will have several professional development opportunities during the workday that are mandatory so that we can bring up our consistency in our baseline and ensure that there is rigor across the schools and across the classrooms. Um, that I can promise you. <laughs> Even though I, I'm sorry, I, I know I didn't give you good, good answers for kinder and K, TK and K. Are you ready for a question? That'd be okay. great. Uh, one of the most common questions that we have is when will teachers assign, teacher assign or students assignments for teachers be given? And when will we receive specifics on schedules? We anticipate sharing teacher roster assignments on the 17th, two days before the start of the school year, like we usually do. Um, if we can do it sooner, we will, but there's a lot of work that goes into making sure all the data are correct. And the last thing we want to do, particularly in this year, is send you a teacher assignment and then two days later say, oops, I made a mistake. Um, we are, I, the, the logistical part of being full distance for the full district is nice because now what we have is we have class lists that have been created in the spring by the teachers. We will be able to honor most of those class lists. However, we are going to make a couple of tweaks. Um, this question I don't think has come up in this group yet, but we are going to put twins together with the same teacher this year. This is different from our normal policy, but as we plan to come from distance back into hybrid, back to full time at some point, in that hybrid mode, we wanna make sure we don't introduce families to additional families unnecessarily. So I know this is a little bit of a shift, but even in full distance, I think this will be helpful because then the kids will have the same teacher, they will be on the same schedule, they will have the same assignments. Um, and then when we transition, if it's something that the families want, I mean, we will of course poll families again and survey and, and work through. We, we had a software provider helping us with the scheduling of 4,300 families and all of their different preferences. So we will offer twins the opportunity to be one in an A group and one in a B group on opposite schedules that the kids need the space and the time away from each other. But they will still be in the same 25 or 30 so that their families are exposed to the exact same people rather than two classes of students. So as we're as we're going between questions, uh, I would uh, of course uh, invite our principals to to share any thoughts as they they come up as well. Um, there's quite a bit of um, questions about uh, families that are creating pods, um, and will they be able to request that certain uh, students be in the same? group or will teachers have the same schedules so that um, the kids will be on the same um, schedule each day for what they're learning? So we had contemplated following all of the requests that came in to create, to create groups of 25 and 30. And in the end, trying to balance out all of the data <laughs> proved to be too, too complicated. Um, we're excited to be able to say that we have balanced classrooms of 25s and 30s. Teachers put a lot of hard work into looking at your class list to see which personalities go well together. What type of a learner are you? Do we have a balance of skills in the classroom? Do we have a balance of parent volunteers in the classroom? Do we have a balance of boys and girls? Do we have, do we have a diversity of experience so that our classrooms don't end up being stacked one way or the other. Um, we want to maintain that because we think that provides the best instructional experience for your student to have a diversity of peers. We understand that there is a desire to have your kids and your friends that you're potting with and in your social bubble to be on similar schedules, but the reality is every child is going to be logging in from an individual device with a set of headphones if you have multiple kids in your, in your home. 
So it won't matter if I log in with Ms. Bao and Dan logs in with Mr. Marchetti because our schedules are going to be pretty aligned. Our teachers at grade levels within sites tend to be pretty much lock and step. So even if the central first grade teachers have a slightly different schedule than the central third grade teachers, if I have friends in first grade with me, I can know that I'm gonna log in at the same time, maybe with one with each of the three teachers, but they can log in, they're working independently on their on their Chromebooks, laptops, iPads, but when they have break time, they'll be together. And that's where you can capitalize on being in a pod. The curriculum is similar. So even if we're not teaching the exact same lesson, the skills are going to be similar. And when we're doing independent work, we can be, be aligned and doing similar skills. Um, so we really do think it is important for our class lists that our teachers have built to stay as intact as possible with the exception of the changes we're making for twins. Um, a few questions on technology. What type of technology is needed? Will would they need a printer? Um, will they be printing lesson material? And can, or can uh, kids use the devices that they have at home already? Kids can absolutely use the devices they have at home already. I would, and I would say there should be no expectation that families are required to print anything. That being said, I know some people like paper better and will certainly be allowed to print if that's their preference. Um, but no expectation. We have workbooks. We have journals. We have everything that we have ordered for the kids to come back to school. And we will, at a site level, work out the logistics of how are we distributing materials and at least seeing my teacher, maybe through a mask, before school starts as we go pick up our textbooks and our materials and our pencil boxes and all the great things that your teachers always prepare for the first day of school. So aside from having a place to work and you know basics like pencils for your kid, and if you don't have pencils at home, we'll provide them. Um, we really, we are public school. We don't think families should need to be printing things and creating their own lessons and buying gobs and gobs of art materials. Um, we will work with our staff and make sure we figure out the logistics of it, but we will get you what you need. I um I saw some some things in the chat um regarding what type of device would support the platforms that were were shared um, that Chingpei had on her slide. A Chromebook with capabilities to get on Google Docs and the Google Suite would will be sufficient. Um, so so really, that's any type of laptop or or Chromebook. Um, that would be absolutely sufficient to engage on any of the platforms that were shared. Our platforms are all web-based, so a smartphone is sufficient. So if you have iPad, iPhone, Android phone, um, Chromebook, laptop, there's, there's no need to go and buy the newest MacBook Air. Um, you know, everybody has their own preferences, but <laughs> if you're watching our budget the way we are, um, and any of those devices we listed will, will work but we will also provide it for your student. Um. Um, okay, so um, there are questions about, will there be uh, support for parents that are less tech savvy or that are non-native um, English speakers? We are going to, one of the things that we're able to do now that we have streamlined our platforms is centralize our support. So while Jerome and I created tutorials and posted a lot on the website for the things that we thought were popular and, and used by many, we, we know we didn't cover everything. So we're happy to be able to centralize support and create video tutorials so that it's easy. The other piece too is really, we don't expect our teachers to be up and running 100% on day one. We never do, even in person. And I think if your child has only interacted with one tech tool on day one, that's not a failure. We're going to teach them slowly and we're gonna model for them and we're gonna practice. Whereas we usually practice getting in line and walking out the door quietly and walking from point A to point B. Maybe this year's routines uh, and rituals practice is going to be, how do I log on? How do I log off? How do I set a timer? How do I turn on the chat? How do I use the whiteboard function in Zoom? I mean, I, the list goes on and on. But if we can teach our children the skills that they need, I think they will be able to independently work regardless of their parents' tech savviness or their parents' language ability. Um, 
I think that that is our responsibility as a school district to make sure we support our teachers so they know how to do that. Um, question on um, special ed and how will pull out services work, speech therapy, for example? So we always try to minimize time lost on instruction. I think this is the part where we're still working out with, with our details and schedules and negotiations. Um, so if we can avoid instructional time, we will. Uh, this is going to be a dance and a partnership that our principals are going to have to support with our specialists and classroom teachers. But your students will receive their services. Um, there's an instructional day and some of it might happen in lieu of something else. Um, okay, there's still a lot of questions about schedules and when they will get specifics and how will working parents be able to manage having their kids on um, Zoom for several hours for the day? So I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and tackle that one. So uh, in terms of schedules, the principals will be working with their communities uh, to get schedules out and communicate those timeframes uh, roughly um, around the similar time frame a couple days before school starts. Uh, we'll get those schedules to you. But know that teachers are receiving their schedules um, as well, um, and they'll be planning for that first day um, too. So um, communication will be forthcoming. We'll, be, we'll build those connections between our families and our teachers um, so that it, um, I want to say is normal, feels uh, closer to being normal for us all. Um, we are shifting, right? This is a new normal for us all. Uh, as we we make the transition, um, I'm just addressing the you know helping each other. Um, our administrative retreat retreat just happened on Monday and Tuesday, and our theme was better together, and and really that applies to us all: uh, parents, uh, families, students, uh, teachers, administrators across the board. working parent uh, with two, two kiddos. Um, it is a balancing act, I think, that, that we're all trying to navigate, right? So um, uh, we're expecting that. We're going to be flexible with that. We recognize that family schedules um, are changing, um, but no, our staff schedules um, are challenging. And, and we all have kiddos too. So um, uh, that is something that we're just going to have to kind of work through together. Um, I do encourage, I know we families are talking about pods um, and, and setting up kind of their social bubbles. Um, we recognize that that's happening. Um, I would encourage each of you to, as you're getting um, uh, accustomed to the new environment, as your, um, your, your, your kiddos are, are making those connections with classmates virtually, um, try and expand um, and, and move out of your comfort zones a bit. Um, reach out to those families that you might not have connected with, uh, because I think when we connect with each other, we're um, ultimately stronger. So um, not an easy, not an easy task, um, but something we have to accomplish together. Um, there's a question about breakout rooms. Yes, teachers will be taught how to use breakout rooms and they can use them effectively and, and rotate back and forth between them. I mean, even when we're in the same physical space, we don't hear every conversation in a breakout room. So we feel confident that a teacher, once we've taught the expectations, can come in and out of breakout rooms and kids won't necessarily be 100% of the time monitored, um, just like it, you know, it's going to take some teaching and some training and some practice. We do not yet no but we do want to uh welcome volunteers in some way shape or form i can imagine that while in the normal circumstance we just we ask you to fill out a form and you don't need to be fingerprinted because of the nature of being alone with kids um, always required fingerprinting i think the threshold is going to be a little bit higher this year and anyone volunteering and wanting to host a zoom session or be part of a breakout group with a student would need to clear that fingerprinting clearance for us but I mean, those are details that I, 
as your teachers share their schedules, because each teacher is going to have an independent schedule. I mean, the start and end day is going to be similar, but how they run their day and, and is their instructional block 30 minutes or 45 minutes or 60 minutes is going to be left up to the teachers um, and their instructional expertise. They'll be able to reach out to you through back to school night and, and talk about volunteering opportunities as we get settled into this new routine. Great. Uh, Pam, we're coming close to the end time. How about um, uh, one more question for us? Okay, one question that's come up quite a bit is will they, will the teachers be from the children's home schools? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, that's a great question to kind of end with. Um, we've had that question a lot and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit of background with that. Uh, so with 100% full distance learning, uh, we're able to ensure that uh, our students have teachers from their school site and they're with their school uh, peers. When we were looking at the AB model and choice, um, again, we need to make sure we're matching numbers and making I'm sure we're matching preferences. And it's in this kind of environment that we might have to do a little bit of mixing, uh, particularly with the distance side. Um, but starting the school year, um, each school um, environment will remain consistent. Um, uh, Nesbitt and Central families uh, will be placed uh, in school specific uh, classrooms. Um, so not to worry on that. That could change in the future. if We need to do an adjustment. Uh, but again, uh, we want to do our best to, to maintain as much uh, consistency as possible. So as I, as I shared um, at the beginning of the meeting, um, we are absolutely working our hardest to get um, all the most relevant and current information uh, to you. We recognize that the summer has been, uh, ha been full of ups and downs and not sure uh, which way things are going and, and true for us as well. Um, as we've been adapting to changing conditions with the goal of, of getting to a most, the most normal environment as we can, as quickly as we can. And, and uh, that just requires us all to be adaptable and shift um, with the changing conditions. So I want to just extend a, a really special thank you to our community for the, your flexibility um, and know that we'll continue to reach out. Um, our principals are amazing. Our teachers are amazing. Um, and again, together, uh, we will make it through this um, and um, end up on the other side um, after a successful 2020-21 uh, school year. So with that, a uh, big thank you to our panel um, our principals. I see uh, Ching Pei with the finger. One more thing, maybe. Go for it. I just want to let everyone know we are going to capture the questions that are in the chat. So even if your question was not answered tonight, we will create a format so that you can get those answers, uh, questions answered. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you all so much um, and have a uh, wonderful um, evening and a great last couple of weeks.